let me start with uh, thanking you that you're still here. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk about uh, autism and schizophrenia in uh, adults. And as a clinician, I can say that differential diagnostics are never easy, but especially differential diagnostics in autism versus schizophrenia are challenging, I think. Therefore, as a researcher, I'm very glad that I have had the opportunity to look more closely at this uh, subject. Something about the background. In the DSM-2, there was no distinction between autism and schizophrenia, and everything was called childhood schizophrenia. And Volkmar and Cohen, around that same period, they, uh, they researched the prevalence of schizophrenia in uh, individuals with autism, and what they found was that the prevalence of schizophrenia was not higher in autism than in a general population. So at that time, this confirmed the idea that these two were very separate disorders, autism and schizophrenia. However, later studies continued to show that there was some degree of overlap between these two disorders, but it was not really clear what exactly. And recent studies uh, studied the genetic uh, causes of autism and schizophrenia, and then it appeared that there was indeed some overlap between the two disorders and that they are genetically linked. From the genetic overlap, you would expect that there are also mm -hmm. cognitive and behavioral features that are in common between autism and schizophrenia. And what I'm very interested in is the behavioral overlap because as clinicians we have to diagnose based on um, behavioral characteristics. So that's what we try to find out. There are some things already known about behavioral overlap and differences between autism and schizophrenia, although it's very few studies. This is interesting. And these studies are done mainly in children or in adults, but then mostly adults with intellectual impairments. Um, sometimes mild impairments. There's only one study that examined uh, high-functioning adults with autism and schizophrenia, and one study that directly compared these two groups. Because there are many studies about autism and schizophrenia, but they never really directly compared these two. So the one study that, that did was a study that was oriented on face orientation. And there it, it appeared that the face orientation was more difficult for uh, people with autism compared to individuals with schizophrenia. But this was only a very small focus. So therefore, it's, uh, we don't really know what the behavioral differences mm -hmm. and overlap are between in high-functioning adults between autism and schizophrenia. And we need this knowledge in order to be able to uh, really differentiate these two groups. Some of you will have seen adults uh, with one or two psychotic episodes in history and with a clinical impression of autistic symptoms. And then it can be so difficult to know what, what is the autism and what is part of the schizophrenia. So that's what we tried to examine. And for our method, we used the SPQ, the Schizotypal Personality Questionnaire, it has been developed for schizotypical um, individuals, but it also has been validated for uh, adults with schizophrenia. It consists of uh, positive symptoms, negative symptoms, and symptoms of disorganization. We also use the AQ, Autism Spectrum Quotient. It has been mentioned before these days. And this examines the autistic features. We've examined 21 adults with autism, 21 adults with schizophrenia, and then the paranoid type. Mean age was relatively high, 44 versus 41 with no significant difference, and a high IQ of 110 versus 107. For autism, we use the ADIR and the and a DSM-4 interview, which is a semi-structured interview in which you ask the criteria of autism. And for schizophrenia, we used the skid. A difficult thing of using self-reports is problems with insight. Uh, in order to have a valid self-report, you have to know yourself. And that depends on theory of mind. And 
actually, no one is perfect in this respect. <laughs> but <laughs> no one is as fast in this respect. <laughs> But this is extremely challenging in individuals with schizophrenia and autism, and that's why we looked more closely to that. And we know that in individual individuals with schizophrenia, insight is very much correlated with treatment compliance. The higher the compliance to treatment, the more insight this person has. The same goes for substance abuse, which is negatively correlated which says that uh, lower substance abuse means higher levels of insight. So we made sure that in our schizophrenia groups, treatment compliance was high and there was no substance abuse. In the autism groups, it was mostly highly, the level of functioning is mostly um, predictive of high insight levels. So that's what we uh, looked at. We made sure that our individuals with autism were highly functioning and with relatively high IQs. Now for the results. This is what we found on the, on the AQ. As you can see, in social skill, the differences are quite large, uh, very significant as well. So the individuals with autism report much more problems in social skills and social behavior. So they have the feeling that they are less socially um, able than the individuals with schizophrenia. In attention switching, there's also a difference which, difference which is significant. So the individuals with autism uh, reported they have more problems with attention switching than the inv individuals with schizophrenia. Attention to detail and imagination um, did not lead to significant differences, but in communication, the difference was and was significant, so more problems with communication in the individuals with autism. We looked at the total AQ score, and um, we used the uh, paradigm in which everyone can get one to four points for each question, and uh, we came to a cutoff score of 123, which could correctly identify 31 of these 42 individuals, 16 of the individuals with autism and 15 of the individuals with schizophrenia. So this means that the AQ is not only usable to distinguish autism versus a neurotypical group, but is also valuable in distinguishing autism versus schizophrenia. So this is hopeful, I think, for the clinicians. This is what the SPQ did. And to our surprise, the negative schizophrenia, the, so the negative um, symptoms were even higher in the individuals with autism than in the individual individuals with schizophrenia. This is something that we already know from liter literature that this is a part of, part of the overlap between these two disorders, but that even in autism it may be higher, although not significant. And that's very surprising. So this means if you have something, someone in front of you who expresses negative symptoms, you do not know, you can't say whether this is part of the schizophrenia or if it's part of autism. Positive schizotypy was very um, significant, significantly different. So this is the differentiation between schizophrenia and autism. There is positive schizotypy, very important. And in disorganization, a similar pat pattern appeared as in negative symptoms, no significant differences. Summing them up, autism, individuals with autism score higher on social skill, attention switching and communication, and the persons with schizophrenia report more positive symptoms. What we then did was uh, we used a higher, higher that's difficult, hierarchical, something like that, backwards analysis, to examine which of these four scales were really able to differentiate between these two groups, and two scales were important in this respect. Firstly, social skill, and social skill of the AQ, you have to think of items like, I find social situations easy, or I find it hard to make new friends, or I prefer doing things alone. These are items that are much more prevalent in autism than in schizophrenia. 
got a nice picture with it. Why aren't you working? I didn't see you coming. <laughs> so these situations would be more prevalent in individuals with autism than in schizophrenia. And altogether, this social skill subskill could explain 28% of the variance between autism and schizophrenia, which is a quite large percentage. And next to social skill, there was positive schizotypy that was also um, very, that could explain 8% of the variance. And these are items like I believe in mind reading or I can hear voices that other people cannot. Interestingly, there was no correlation between positive symptoms and any of the AQ subskills. So this means that autistic features are, in the, are not correlated with the positive symptoms that are uh, characteristic of schizophrenia. When we look at the overlap, this is most clearly in the negative symptoms. And uh, we looked at the AQ and correlations with, this, with these negative symptoms. And then we see that this is mainly correlated with the problems in social skill and social behavior and communication. So this specifically is this overlap part. And it would be interesting to see if, if there are genetic underpinnings for specifically this characteristic. This organization, which is based on eccentric behavior and odd speech, um, and this is not surprising either because um, in autism you expect to see more behavior which is not socially appropriate, which may overlap with these disorganization symptoms. Furthermore, attention to detail was also overlapping and that may be attributed to both groups having problems with their central coherence. And that's what we see, that the three cognitive theories of autism, uh, weak theory of mind, weak central coherence, and problems in executive functioning, also appear in individuals with schizophrenia. So here we have the overlap. Taking it together, you can say that only social skill and positive symptoms can validly distinguish between autism and schizophrenia. So as a clinician, these are the things that you want to look at in individuals. Whereas the presence of negative symptoms, disorganization, imagination and attention to detail, these do not differentiate. So it may be wise to not look at these um, characteristics more, more specifically. So, I've got little time. Yes, you have time. Little time, okay. good. Um, you have, if you want, under five minutes, if you, if you need five minutes. I can be faster than that. Okay. okay. As a guideline, I'd say when positive symptoms are present in a person that you see for a diagnostic process, you need information about early development to examine whether there are autistic features or not. And if there is no information of early development, then usually we stop the diagnostic process because you do not know if you see negative symptoms or if you see characteristics of autism. So that may be the message of this uh, talk. So, one more thanks to all participants, colleagues, and thank you. Thank you.